we are creating a survey. Mm -hmm. So at Heterodox Academy, it's a collection. We have uh, 400 professors who've signed on mm -hmm. to say that we think that we need viewpoint diversity. We think right. that no university should be politically homogeneous. Uh, we're, we're creating a bunch of products that we think will help uh, address these problems. And the first thing we need is good data. We're mostly social scientists. So we're creating something called the Fearless Speech Index. It's a simple survey. You come to our site, you get your own link, you send it out, and you can find out who is afraid of speaking openly, right. on what topics, and why. Is it because you're afraid the professor will retaliate or because other students will? So uh, we're just pilot testing it now, but uh, by April, we should have it up on the website. So anybody who wants to do a survey at your own school, mm -hmm. go to heterodoxacademy.org, you'll find a link, and then you'll find out. Um, you know, maybe it's that, the, you know, the, for example, the men, what I'm finding when I talk, the men are often very quiet during my talks. They don't ask questions, they just sit there. But afterwards, they come up to me like they were you know, abused spouses or something. Right. Because at some schools, the men feel as though they can't speak. And then they go and vote for Trump. Yeah. So, so the way I think about it is that there's like all these fuses coming together. And each one was burning separately to some extent. And they all intersected in the fall of 2015. And uh, so one of them is academic trends. <clears throat> so the professoriate. So the professoriate has leaned left in most fields for a long time, right. but it only leaned left. Um, we have, here's where we do have good data. Um, it's in, it, from the early 90s to the late 90s is the big shift. Mm -hmm. um, it's as the greatest generation retires. There were a lot of Republicans in, in that generation, whereas the baby boomers, many of them came rushing to the academy either to avoid the Vietnam War or to study racism. So it's in the 90s that the academy goes from leaning left to being very Fair solidly enough. on yep. the left. So you lose diversity there. Um, and that's also part of why you get this faculty-driven wave of PC in the early 90s. I would also, if I can add to that, uh, just, and, and I don't know how far his uh, influence uh, extended outside of literary and cultural studies, although I, I sit a lot in sociology and history. Michel Foucault, when you mentioned right. everything is power. That's right, exactly. Um, and I think he actually is very proto-libertarian in many of his mm -hmm. discussions. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a different yeah. story. But there was no question, we were all Foucauldians, and to, yes. we were trained exactly. to look at what, what does this say about power, whatever the text, whatever the area of subject. So. I think that's exactly right. There are, again, there's all these fuses coming together. And so one is a sort of a separate um, evolutionary process of ideas about power, privilege, and oppression. And that meets up with, and that's from the humanities, ideas from psychology about trauma, bullying, abuse, uh, the idea of microaggressions was invented by a psychologist. So you get these Foucauldian ideas, you get these psychological victimhood ideas coming together. Mm -hmm. The big surprise, the thing that people were not expecting, was that the students are the ones who are demanding it now. This is what took me and Greg, or took Greg by surprise, because Greg had been fighting all these speech codes, right. all these things imposed by administrators and faculty, right. and the students had always generally wanted more freedom. Right, yeah. But what Greg was beginning to see was that it's the students themselves who are saying, you can't say that. Stop her from saying that. We need rules to stop him from yeah. saying that. And that's what was new. Yeah. Take whatever tribalism, groupishness, virtue signaling, take all the things that people have always done, give 13-year-olds Facebook beginning in 2006, and they're, you know, you're really ramping up the, the, you know, the, the mob punishment, the fear of saying something wrong. Um, so the kids who entered college, so Facebook opened its policy in 26, 2006, so the very first kids who'd been on Facebook since 13 only graduated in 2014. Mm -hmm. So s professors have been encountering these kids who are just really different from the kids they were used to who were born before 1980. Um, and that's, I think, part. it's one of the threads. Right, there's right. all and, these threads And there's together. no, this is not a monocausal explanation. No, right? there's, there's I, a can lot give of, you, yeah. I can give you seven or eight. Yeah. yeah. Do students see themselves, and, and this goes back to the question of kind of a victim culture, do you think that, and I realize to say the typical student, if, if there is one, but do they see themselves more as individuals, uh, say, than when you and I were growing up? Because, you know, I always kind of felt like I was an individual, and the kids that my, fr uh, my kids, their friends, they seem very individual. Uh, I, and, you know, I, I realize these are ridiculously small samples, or examples, but do kids, you know, do they feel less individualized in this that kind I, of culture? That I can't say. I have no idea how they feel about this. Um, I think rather what we can say 
is that they have been exposed, they've been raised in a moral world that has different pillars than ours. So you and I, I was born in 1963, I presume you were around. Yes, exactly. We were raised by people who either fought World War II or at least remembered it. We were raised during the Cold War. We were raised to think that liberty and freedom were really, really important concepts. And boy, they really were. There was the free world and the not free world. Right. It was really clear, liberty matters. And it was American, like we are the pioneers. And what I'm noticing is that now, and actually I can show you data on this, you just do a you know, Google trend search. Um, diversity and inclusion is going up and up and up. That phrase is becoming very, very prominent. Um, and actually even multiculturalism is going down. So diversity and inclusion is becoming primary. Our kids have been raised with such anti-bullying training um, no, you know, if it's Valentine's Day, everyone has to get a val- We can't have anyone be excluded. So our kids have been raised where liberty and freedom are not really talked about. Like even yeah. China isn't, you know, a slave country. I mean, it's, right. so those liberty doesn't matter as much. Diversity and inclusion is much, much more important than but, we and, ever experienced. And the diversity doesn't extend to say, hey, you know what? We're all different. No. It's, so it's, 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 it's not groups. that diversity. It's, yeah. it's the three to six specific groups. That's right. what we mean by diversity. So, so it's important to realize that this is not happening at most colleges. Mm-hmm. Um, any college at which students come to campus, take class, and go home, you don't get this right. because they, they're living in multiple moral worlds. Um, if people are different ages, you don't get this. Um, this is only at four-year residential schools where there's a moral world that emerges as these students yeah, this is come like together. The, the kids being shipwrecked in, um, <laughs> in uh, what's the... Uh, yeah, uh, that we all read, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 Lord of the Flies. Lord of the Flies, Thank that's you. right. Yes. Yeah. It's Gilligan's um, Island that's right. Except for Gilligan's a bachelor, I- bachelor degree. Well, yeah, it's, it's Gilligan's Island or Lord of the Flies, right. but with a gigantic staff of therapists and yes. deans around to yeah, make yeah. sure that everybody plays nice. Right. Well, I think we need to rethink the way that we do diversity training. I think the way that it's often done, given that the evidence suggests diversity training either doesn't work or it can backfire if it's done with hostility, I think we need to recognize that as a country, we are in big trouble. We face an existential threat of coming apart, and Mm -hmm. this is now obvious to everybody. And I think that we need to rethink diversity training. If you're going to have a multi-ethnic, multi-racial democracy, you you have to get everything right. You have to look at the centrifugal forces blowing us out mm-hmm. and the centripetal forces pulling us together. Uh, so just this morning, uh, Kareth Foster gave a great talk on, on how she does diversity training. She uses humor. You've got you to get people to be, be a little lighter, mm-hmm. give people the benefit of the doubt, recognize that diversity is difficult, and recognize that political diversity is, every year or decade, political diversity is a bigger divide. And actually, racial, you know, we've been making progress yeah. on race and gender. Uh, and sexual orientation. So a lot of the things we've been focusing on, I mean, fortunately, we're making progress. Mm -hmm. The political divide is now, I believe, the one that's going to do us in. And I think it actually might do us in. I think terrible things can happen in this country. And so that... You know, college has changed in the 200 or so years it's Mm -hmm. really been around in the U.S. And it became, fully became a a mass phenomenon around 1970. That's when a, a majority of high school seniors went on to some form of college. We, we hear now partly because it's so expensive mm-hmm. that the stakes are high in college and that, um, you know, that clearly puts anxiety on parents, on students, on professors. Yep. Uh, there are fewer and fewer tenure track lines, the, the business model of school. How does that affect the campus climate and uh, particularly the issues that you think about and, and what needs to be adjusted there? Yeah, I'm not sure that it affects the campus climate so much right now, but I think it's likely to lead to a huge disruption at some point in the next 10, 15 years. <clears throat> so, you know, if you go back, you know, five years before any of this, the, the intense, you know, PC stuff was happening, uh, once MOOCs started coming out and the cost of college was such an issue, a lot of people were saying it's just a matter of time before there's a big disruption. If college is not delivering the value, if there are alternatives, it's just a matter of time before most schools go out of business. Harvard and Yale, Chicago, right. Stanford, they'll always be there, right. but most schools will go out of business. And I think what's happened is as college has gotten weirder and weirder and all this bad publicity, most people in the country look at the coddling culture, they look at the students protesting, and they're not sympathetic. Many of them are horrified. So I think that's a black mark on, uh, on colleges. And what are they doing to deal with it? A lot of the things that the elite schools are doing to deal with the protests are hiring a lot more administrators and a lot more expensive programs. So um, 
I think they're kind of digging in their own grave a little faster. They're speeding up the time yeah. of the disruption. As soon as someone can come up with a way of actually training or certifying people so that they can actually get jobs, I think colleges are going to face a big loss of market share. Well, and it'll be a shame too because, I mean, the liberal arts have always, and particularly the humanities, have always been kind of suspect. Yeah. And those are really, in a lot of ways, that those are the types of... Um, uh, areas, course areas, as well as um, uh, frames of mind that would actually help us navigate a more diverse, That's tolerant right. society exactly. in the best way possible. That's right. It's sort of the classical things that we say, the classical things we say about the liberal arts and the liberal arts education are just what we need now. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, you know, my wife uh, went to Smith as an undergrad. She loved it. She loved literature. So she went to the University of Virginia to get a master's degree, thinking that she loves literature. Let right. me go study literature. And she was so disappointed because it was really more about politics and power and Foucault type. I mean, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't about literature. It wasn't liberal arts thinking. It right. was very ideological. Yeah. So, you know, I think, the, I think the humanities have kind of lost credit, and I think it's their own fault.